Cities and skateboards have always had an admittedly tense relationship in the past, but recently, that appears to be changing. Here in Vancouver, the Park Board is currently writing a policy called Vancouver Cityscape. It's a plan to improve existing skate parks and even create more skate facilities across the city. So for this video, I want to know, why the change of heart? Well, the first thing you should know is that Vancouver has always been a hotspot for skateboarding in Canada. Sure, it helps that the city isn't uh, frozen half the year, but it also has an incredibly rich history with the sport. Skateboarding initially took off here in the 60s, as teenagers took to skateboarding in parking lots, swimming pools, and makeshift ramps. That wave of interest helped create some of North America's first skate parks, like the China Creek Bowl in 1979. From there, major events like the Expo Contest in 1986 brought internationally renowned skateboarders like Rodney Mullen and Tony Hawk to the city, further cementing it as a skateboarding hub in Canada. But what really put Vancouver on the map was the 1990s. Vancouver's architecture had just gone through a love affair with concrete, creating a downtown jungle of plazas, steps, ledges, and railings. A natural habitat for suits and yuppies, but also fertile grounds for something else. A whole new genre of skateboarding called street skating. Skateboarders were now increasingly headed to the city and skating any skatable surface they could find. For them, a downtown plaza was the perfect venue for a session, and Vancouver had plenty to offer. Spots like Commerce Place, Georgia Banks, HSBC, and Lot 19. That led to the creation of Slam City Jam, an international competition that drew skateboarders from around the world every year to Vancouver from 1994 to 2006. From here on out, Vancouver wasn't just a skate hub, it was a skate destination. But let's be real here, skateboarding's history in Vancouver is also a story of tension. While the sport was gaining popularity in the city, many, including the local government, saw this as a problem. Skateboard tricks could damage property, and businesses complained that skateboarders themselves were a dangerous nuisance. The board slips out from under their feet, and it will hit people in the head or blast through a window. And the response? Grind blockers, skate stoppers, caps, bumps, and other designs that made surfaces virtually impossible for skateboarding. But the real kicker was Bylaw 77, which made it illegal to skateboard on streets or sidewalks. It's illegal to skateboard here or anywhere else in Vancouver. Getting caught carries a $75 fine. The message from the city was clear. Skateboarding was not welcome in Vancouver. But then people realized something. Skateboarding has its benefits. First off, it's a physical activity. You want to burn some calories? Well, according to Harvard University, skateboarding burns up to 420 calories every hour. Plus, it's less soul-crushing than a treadmill. It's a transportation method, a fun pastime, and now, an Olympic sport. But it also goes way deeper than that. There is clearly a rich culture that has developed around skateboarding. Perhaps it's because of its roots in counterculture, or maybe it's because the sport itself highly encourages self-expression and creativity. But I think a key part of it is that skateboarding has a very social community. It really has a way of bringing people together. Skaters often visit several spots and parks in a day, and at each place, they connect with their peers as they work out different tricks. And ultimately, you can't deny that it's had an impact. This one sport has somehow gone on to influence art, politics, fashion, music, and popular culture as a whole. Now, full disclosure, I'm not a skateboarder. Like, this is my attempt at an ollie. Yeah. Oh. Oh. But I like to think that I know a thing or two about city policy. And that's where I see some connections. There are a lot of buzzwords that get thrown around in city policies. Words like active transportation, social resilience, vibrant spaces, and yada yada. But here's the gist of it. Cities want an active and healthy population, a supportive community, and public spaces that are full of life and energy. Well, I can't help but think that might look like a bunch of people skateboarding. And I'm not the only one who sees it that way. What many have realized is that skateboarding surprisingly aligns with many of the objectives found within city policies. And that appears to be changing the tides a bit. Throughout the mid-2000s, the park board began to build skate parks around the city, such as the Hastings Skate Park in 2001 and the Plaza in 2004. But most importantly, an amendment to Bylaw 77 in 2005 made skateboarding on streets legal again. That brings us to today. Like always, skateboarding is an evolving community, and one that's becoming much more diverse, thanks to the efforts of many who are working to make it more inclusive. 
It's not just teens anymore. There are more people from all ages, genders, and backgrounds who are skateboarding. And it isn't just skateboards either. Now there are roller skates, BMX bikes, scooters, and other things on wheels. Today, it is nearly impossible to define the modern skateboarder, but one thing is for sure. This is a growing community and one that needs more spaces. I think that need is evidenced by makeshift skate parks that pop up around the city every now and then, such as this one at the old Britannia Center tennis courts. In the absence of a skate park nearby, community members have taken it upon themselves to build and maintain a collection of ramps, spines, rails, and uh, garbage cans for people to skate on. But these spaces are not officially sanctioned by the city, meaning that their fate is incredibly precarious. There are currently plans being made to redevelop the Britannia Center, and it's not clear whether this skate park will be allowed to remain. Oh great, there's a lot more in the background now. Well anyways, so in the midst of all that, the local government is now putting together Cityscape, a plan for the future of skate spaces in Vancouver. They're currently working in consultation with skateboarders and the broader community at large to learn how to improve its current facilities and create more skate-friendly spaces in the city. And I'm using the term skate-friendly spaces very intentionally. What's kind of unique about this plan is that it's moving beyond skate parks to thinking about how to create skatable spaces all over the city. This could look like a network of multi-use paths or having more reinforced surfaces and public spaces for grinds and other tricks. And of course, it won't be easy. Putting this skateboard strategy together will ultimately require a discussion that balances the needs and interests of many different skate stakeholders. But the fact that the park board is going through all this trouble to put this plan together in the first place really tells me something. Skateboarding is here to stay, and cities might be better off adapting to or even nurturing the needs of this community rather than fighting it. If you want to learn more about the city skate strategy or share your thoughts on this issue, visit shapeyourcity.ca slash skateboard amenities. Their latest survey is up right now.